On this episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show, we talk about articular cartilage repair rehab, how we assess functional core stability, and ways to analyze research articles. The Ask Mike Reynolds Show. Helping people feel better, move better, and perform better. Welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the Ask Mike Reynolds Show. I am up here at Champion PT and Performance up in Boston, Mass. We're here to answer your questions about physical therapy, fitness, sports performance, business, anything you guys want to talk about, we're here to answer your questions. So introduce the crew again, everybody. I think we're familiar now with uh, uh, our set cast. I feel like we've been here for a while. We're pretty good. But Lenny Macrina in the house, LennyMacrina.com. Dave Tilly, shiftmovementscience.com, Dan Pope, fitnesspainfree.com, and Mike Skidudo at mikeskidudo.com. Skidudo, who did not get the memo to wear a black shirt today. He didn't get it. All for, of us. for those watching the video. For those not watching the video, we're all wearing black shirts. Not at all. We have a couple of students here today. We said, geez, this might be your guys' last. Uh, batch of recording oh, we're doing, right? Nice. We're going to have a new crew coming here. Thank God. We have Logan Genghis Klon from, um, from where are you from? Wash U? <laughs> Wash U. And we, right? Where you? I'm close on that. And then, well, I don't even remember your nickname. Tally Ho? Zach Tally Ho? Remember Billy Mass and Teddy? <laughs> from, Re- from Regis here to ask some awesome questions. So, um, what do we got, guys? Oh, by the way, we're gonna. This is this. this we gotta make this one a little bit more timely. So Zach and I just went to uh, the sports sections team concept conference. Is that what that stands for? TCC. Yes. Team concept conference. So. They gotta change that mouthful. <laughs> team <laughs> concept <laughs> conference. TCC. We just went there and we are on full effect trying to get Zach Tally a job. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna extend this to the podcast. Zach, Zach has been an amazing student of ours. We're gonna start a Twitter trend here. Hashtag get <laughs> Zach a job. Hashtag get Zach a job. If anybody's got a job, he'll take it. You just have to be somewhere between the Atlantic and Pacific Ocean, and he's in. Janitors, cooks. Janitors, yeah. Cook. If you're watching this in 2020, in yeah, so he's still unemployed. Right. He's still looking. That's right. He probably will be, but no, he was a good student. Hired him. He's good. Logan, what do we got? Question number one. All right. No yeah. job for Logan. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have a job, don't you? No, not I thought you had a job. <laughs> Get Logan a job, too. <laughs> no, I thought you had a job. All right. All right. Don't yeah. be selfish, Logan. <laughs> <laughs> Martin from Germany. What's your take on the safety of isometric quad exercises in full extension in the first six to eight weeks post-op after patellofemoral cartilage repair? Has your view on PT after cartilage repair changed since your last paper in JOSPT? Okay, so articular cartilage repair. So somebody with a microfracture, maybe an OATS, maybe an ACI or the new Macy type thing. Uh, patellofemoral, so that could be either the patella or the trochlea. But the question is, can we safely do quad sets in full extension right away? What do you guys think? Yeah, I know the answer. <laughs> full extension is no contact yeah. yet, right? Bingo, right? No, we, or unless, yeah. So the patellofemoral joint does not articulate, right? The patella does not articulate with the trochlea at zero degrees. So there are no contraindications for quad sets immediately after surgery, and we do them right away. Because you want to get as much quad as you can. So to answer your question, I'd say no, go nuts, right? Part of articular cartilage rehab for, especially with patellofemoral, is really understanding exactly where that lesion location is, right? So contact with the doctor and communication is super helpful because he can tell you exactly where and probably what degree of range of motion that that may articulate. Mm -hmm. So for example, we always say this in our our rehab protocols and stuff, but if you have a lesion that articulates at 45 degrees, there's no reason why you can't do rehab from say zero to 30 degrees and probably even 60 plus degrees. You just kind of avoid that middle ground where it articulates. Right? The issue with patellofemoral, not to go too far on this, I don't, I don't know why I'm continuing. <laughs> the issue with patellofemoral <laughs> is that it's not just compressive, it's compressive and shear. So we are cautious with it. If you don't know the range of motion we get, that it articulates, we have to be a little bit more cautious. We don't want to shear that lesion. But at zero degrees, no problem. Right? Anyone disagree? No. Perfect. And, and, and no, I don't know if we've changed much since JOSBT um, <laughs> 10 years ago. I believe honestly, I don't, think, I don't think we have. I mean, we're, prob- we're not going any faster. 
Right. You know, and all those principles. That are the, the paper I wrote in JSBT, I did a whole um, um, guest editorial for a whole issue on articular cartilage stuff. And, and, um, and it was based on the principles, not necessarily on do this week one. I mean, that stuff was in there, but it was the principles. So I'd say that hasn't changed, and I don't think the technology and the surgeries have gotten much better either that warrants, hey, let's go a little faster. So I'd say no. So. I read that in my OCS prep. Thank you. That was in your OCS prep? <laughs> nice. That was one of them. That, loud that, in there. Nice. Did they reference me in the OCS prep? Not for a lot of stuff. What a jerk. What a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I bet the SES does. Yeah, yeah it does. Yeah, yeah, it does. Not to pick a fight. Old chapter. <laughs> so, anywho. What do we got? Tally Ho. What's the next question? We got Jay from Dallas. Hey, guys. What are your thoughts on muscle testing and assessment of core musculature and core stability? Do you use tests such as the supine leg lowering test in the Kendall textbook often used and taught in PT school, or do you use a more functional assessment? I saw Pope knock one of those out last week. Boom. Yeah? Yeah. Killer. Functional you assessment well, you of the did core. So well. Do you remember it? Like, so <laughs> I, I'm going to preface Dan's answer here to say, you know, just to let's start building a little anticipation, right? But we're actually putting a lot of work together here on kind of a new product we're going to be releasing in 2018. So that now that I said it, we have to finish it. But 2018, that's going to go over kind of our performance system. And part of that is how we functionally assess the core to an extent. Because we talked about this quite a bit. We said, how deep do we want to get into this? And you know we can you know we settled on some stuff, but Dan, you wanna you wanna tackle this one? How do you assess functional core stability? Okay, yeah, that's a cool phrase. <laughs> well, I guess it really depends what the person's presenting with, but um, I like to check to see if the, the core is a player, um, in the sense that if someone's having some FAI or they're having some patellofemoral pain problems, are they able to control themselves first and like a step down? Okay, what's going on with step down? I need to kind of look a little bit more uh, deep, so maybe we'll do something where you're on your back, hips up, doing a bit of a march to see if you're able to control motion. I would say that's part of core control. Um, part of me wants to say that it is very important. The other part is it, it really just depends on who comes through the door. You know, it's, If someone comes in, they've got some sort of low back pain, they're pretty much always gonna get some sort of stability for me. Um, but if it comes down to someone who's specific, I think they're hurting themselves for a particular reason, then I'm probably gonna break it down a little bit more. Uh, but I'll do a leg lowering test from time to time if I do think they've got poor motor control and strength in the core. Um, that's maybe showing up in their higher intensity activities outside and they're not controlling that motion well. So I'll test it. That's a good test, right? Yeah. Dave, you anything different? What do you do? Uh, no, I do a lot of the same what does. I would say we both agree that there's like probably different buckets that you're looking for things. You know, someone who is on your load, is it someone who's running and cutting and that kind of stuff. Or someone who's static is a little bit different. But I would say there's a lot of Paul Hodges work has just kind of like demystified how complex the core is and it's like, it gets very overwhelming. So I think we oversimplify core testing sometimes. So keep it with a grain of salt. Right, I think we I think we intentionally lean towards simple core testing, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Part of what we started doing when we were outlining our, our performance system and our, the movement assessment component that's gonna be in this, is we said, do we just do some of the basic core exercises and assess how well they do it? So like bird dog, dead bug, side plank, those types of things, and, and we'll just see how well they do mm -hmm. with it, right? And I think we all like that, and I think we all do that, right? We kind of have them like part of your first treatment session is probably also, you know, looking at that, you know. I think what we settled on, though, in the system here, and maybe you guys can jump in, Mike and Len, just with your thoughts on that, is instead of looking at how does the core function, I think what in, it isolated in terms of that, that, in terms of functional core stability assessment, what we did was let's see how your body moves and do we have any compensatory patterns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because I think Tilly was alluding to that and Pope was too, that it's, I want to see them functionally doing something. I want to see them squat, I want to see them hinge, I want to see them... Uh, lunge, I want to see things of that nature because that's what they're doing every day, especially the population we see here at kind of a higher level uh, group of people. But you can apply that concept to anybody because everybody has to squat, hinge in their daily tasks. So, yeah, I want, doing a leg lowering test, which I personally don't do, um, will tell me if they can lower their leg, which is awesome if they're lying in bed and trying to lower their leg. But to me, <laughs> I want I've never done that. <laughs> right, no, one time. <laughs> so, one time. <laughs> so to me, I want to see them do that's things fantastic. functionally. Maybe I am slightly biased because that's what our program. I think it's maybe. Above. I think it's like just like the shoulder, right? Like you would check pressing, but you would also check isolated cuff strength. Kind of the same things you would probably want to check the movement patterns themselves, but you never know. You might need a someone just might be weak. Yeah, right. I see a lot of people that are trying to do things like kipping, kipping patterns, have low back pain. Maybe they can't control their interior mm -hmm. core well. So that that would be something that's very patient, population specific. Yeah. Right, and to me for that, so you just, you, if somebody's trying to kip, they're probably fairly fit, right? Let's assume they're fa fairly fit and they're trying to do this. They probably have nice 
recti, right? Is that the plural of rectus? <laughs> Rec rectuses? They, have, they probably have like, you know, good abs where they actually look pretty good, right? So they have strong abs, but they don't have anterior core control. And I think that's the point yeah. is I don't think we isolate. I don't think we do a manual muscle test for rectus abdominis, for mm -hmm. example. So for us, like what we kind of said in our movement assessment was, all right, when you extend your hip, are you extending your hip or right. are you compensating at your back? When you abduct your hip, are you compensating at your back? Right? When you do a sit up position, are you compensating using your hip flexors? Those types of things. So I think that's how we approach functional stability. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Anything else, Mike? You got anything you, uh, you want to add to the mix? I mean, this is a big um, topic. Yeah, right. We yeah, talked about this for hours. I think you guys kind of covered it, but I think um, one thing, one component of it, yeah, you can test the strength, but you want to test the controlled mobility, see if they have motor control to move in and out of patterns. And that's kind of where my head goes when, when I'm looking at core stability. I want to see if they can move in and out of different positions with control. So not just so much putting them in a static plank, you know, it's mm -hmm. a little bit dynamic, but putting them into a position, I want to see if they can move in and out of a position with control and uh, kind of meet the criteria there. Yeah, so I think we all kind of agree then, right? Like, so we do some big movement patterns, like squats, lunges, steps, right? That's how we assess core. And if something doesn't seem to be going well, I think we'd break it down and we'd look a little bit more at, uh, almost like how does, how does the body move you know, and can the core stabilize while it's moving? I think that's, I think that's kind of in a nutshell. And then you can you can make that up for your, you know, special population that you might have in front of you, and just come up with some specific, right? Like, if a baseball pitcher is having a hard time, you know, the same thing with the kipping pull-up that Dan said. If they're having a hard time with the anterior core control, it doesn't mean they're weak. It just means they have poor, you know, core neuromuscular patterning sometimes. You know, so it's a, it's an educational process. So. But awesome. All right, we'll, one more, right? We got number three coming. Let's knock out another one. I feel like we could do a whole episode on that, but let's do a third one here. All right, we got Mike from Salt Lake City. When reviewing research articles, what is your method of analyzing the studies to determine relevancy and applicability? What are the key items you look for to determine if a study is good or bad? All right, how, so how, when you're reading a research article in a journal, how do you tell if it's a good article? I don't want to date the episode, but I just released a blog post. <laughs> on a journal article that I reviewed this week what? on rotator cuff repairs versus non-op for a rotator cuff tear. So you can tie this in here because I'm not following. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> he asked, "How would I review a paper?" So it depends on the paper, it depends on the population, it depends on so many things. But I got to look at the methodology. I'm gonna look at how they recruited um, their participants. Um, I want to see the stats they were in. So many different things. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't know. If you guys have any other, yeah, I think I mean sample size is usually like the biggest one for me. Right. I think depending on what their correlation or what they're looking at is big, but sample size, the type of subjects they used, how they got them, I think is a really important one because yeah. convenient sampling of people who happen to be in your area is very different than a randomized like stratified right. sample. And then I'd always say that like I actually look most often to the end to see what they admit is a bias. I think that says a lot about their methodology if they like yeah. admit all the things they know are wrong versus like casually glaze them over. Yeah. I think it says a lot about the papers that I study. reviewed did a pretty good job of looking at their limitations yeah. and when you read that you're like I don't know if the conclusions that they came to can be mm. you know as valid. Yeah. When you see what their issues were with their own paper, you know. Yeah. Right? So, you know, you really got to you can't just uh, you know, it's the abstract gives you a little information but so much in the methodology that's going to kind of give away you know, the true facts yeah, of the yeah. paper. Yeah. I think that's a big point because in school we were taught a lot about like the level of evidence and you kind of just go on that. So say like you have your different tiers of, of evidence, but it's, it's important to look deeper into the methodology because there are different papers in the same level of evidence that have higher or lower quality. It's important to kind of weed that out. Um, I think one more thing too, I think it, when I was reading a lot of your guys' research in school, I think one of the best things was like there's a lot of interdisciplinary people in the paper. It's not only PTs or only surgeons. It's like handful of surgeons, mm -hmm. handful of PTs, maybe a couple like uh, biostatisticians who understand that stuff. Right. I think that gives a lot more power when everyone's kind of like weighing in. Yeah. Right. I'd say the first thing I look at is probably bias. Right? I see, is there a conflict of interest with the authors? And, and unfortunately, in some of, uh, journal articles, are, there's a lot of journals now. There's more journals than ever, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're profitable, right? Like, like people, you start a journal just usually because it's profitable, right? You don't do it necessarily to help the world, right? So right. all these publishers are, do, are starting journals to just have more and more journals out there. So you're starting to see some papers that maybe wouldn't get published in AJSM or JOSBT, but they're getting in a lesser quality type journal. So that's one thing to look at too, is the quality mm -hmm. of the yeah, journal 
what you're looking at. Um, but you're starting to see stuff like, like, okay, well, this guy, he actually sells that product or he distributes that product or something. So we, uh, we, we, it's a complete conflict of interest and bias because the, the, we always say that the, the most evil thing in research or science, right, is, is bias. Right, so if you have a conflict of interest, you're you're going to you could sway the results quite a bit. So I think bias is number one, and then like Lenny, methodology, right? But you got to look at the methodology. It has to pass your test first. For me, I look at a lot of articles in the baseball world, and I look at their methodology, and I immediately say they measured that wrong, and I disregard the whole paper. Now you guys might not, because you might not realize that that's not the best way to measure a baseball player, but I do. And I'll immediately discredit that article. Not everybody does, but it's something. So you'll get better at that when you start doing that. But carefully scrutinize the methods. I think that's that's the biggest issue there. I think a friend of ours, too, Phil Page, has a whole list of journals. So not just journal article, but journals that are kind of bogus, and you got to really keep an eye out. It's not just the a article. List of that? Yeah. He, I think he did list? a talk recently. Bogus a, journal list? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <Blacklist>. Journals <laughs> that are not necessarily peer reviewed, or journals that are. You know, almost knockoff journals that appear to be like Shamless. legit. Like the, I mean, I don't want to give an example because yeah, I, please I don't. could. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so be aware. You may want to look up what Phil Page uh, he has for a collection of journals as well. That's funny. That's what yeah. you're going for. The collection of misfit journals. Yeah. <laughs> like that. Awesome. Yeah, misfits. Awesome. Great questions. That was a good one today. I, I liked a few of those questions. That was awesome. So thanks so much, guys. Head to MikeRattle.com, click on that podcast link and ask us some questions. Keep them coming. We still get a bunch. Every, every day it seems like there's more coming in. So come on in. We'll answer as many as we can. Please head to iTunes. You can rate and review and, and knock on. I don't know what this means. I think we might be in Spotify soon. Oh, I don't know yeah. what that means. I, I like Spotify. I probably won't it's listen to our own podcast on Spotify, but it may be there. But anyway, uh, thanks for everything, and we'll see you guys on the next episode.